and thank you for coming to this presentation today. Um, so I'm Patricia Martinez Garzón from GSZ Potsdam in Germany, as uh, Chris already presented me. And uh, I would like to start by extending the thank you to the organizers of this seminar series, um, Chris and also Elisa and the other organizers. So in this talk, I would like to provide you with an overview of uh, what do we know on the interplay between seismic and seismic deformation on the North Anatolian Fault in Turkey. I will present uh, different uh, works, many of which are led by postdocs and students in our group and also colleagues. <clears throat> and I will start uh, by naming them here. These are uh, Dirk Becker and Amandin Amemutu from our section in GFZ Potsdam. Virginie Durand, which is a former member of our section and currently at TTH uh, Zurich. Gianmaria Bocchini from the Ruhr University of uh, Bochum and uh, the core of our team at the GFZ, uh, Grzegorz Kiatek, uh, Georg Dresen, and uh, Marco Bonhoff. So this is the outline of the topics I'm planning to show you today. Don't be scared, it looks quite a lot, but hopefully we will go through it. Um, I will start with an intro about seismic and seismic deformation, and then I will proceed to show you different studies which I organized according to scale, from the entire fault towards more focus on the western part of the fault, the Sea of Marmara region, and then a number of detailed uh, local studies about uh, seismic and seismic deformation in the Armutlu Peninsula, south of Istanbul. And I will finalize with a summary of the main results and conclusions. So let's start uh, with the intro. As many of you possibly know very well, over the last uh, 20 or even 25 years, there has been a body of observations showing evidence that faults can slip uh, over a wide range of durations and frequencies from dynamic slip manifested as earthquakes to slow or a seismic slip. Many observations um, suggest that um, these two end members also interact uh, with each other. In regular earthquakes, for example, the magnitude is proportional to the source duration to the power of um, three, um, in agreement with physical models describing the process. However, the scaling of the slow slip uh, events is uh, unclear, traditionally understood as following a linear scaling relation of magnitude and source duration, as you see in this graphic, and more recently questioned to follow the same scaling um, as regular earthquakes. And uh, most importantly, no physical model currently exists uh, for this type of slip transient phenomena. However, different uh, mechanisms are uh, already identified to play an important role in governing the different uh, slip modes. This includes the pressure and temperature conditions, uh, the slip velocity, the fault structure and materials composing the fault, as well as the presence of uh, geometrical complexities. So it might be important to briefly summarize uh, in this kind of zoo of different observations, the different types of processes that we associate with uh, a seismic uh, slip or fault uh, creep. So first, uh, we have the creep that occurs on a fault uh, portion over long time periods. And this uh, can occur at the boundary of the lower crust as viscose creep. But there are also indeed fault segments that uh, exhibit fault creep over a substantial part uh, of its depth extent and for long periods of time. One of the best uh, documented examples is the creeping section of the San Andreas Fault, which you can see here. And uh, it is a segment of about 150 kilometers long between San Juan Bautista and Cholet that displays a long-term uh, shallow creep. The main physical mechanism that is attributed to this creeping behavior of the San Andreas is the presence of talc bearing serpentinite on the fault, which uh, modifies the frictional properties such as to um, display velocity strengthening. But in fact, even when creep does occur uh, on some fault segments for long time periods, the fault sites are typically not continuously slipping, but the slip is accommodated in a number of different transients as the one that you see here in this figure. And uh, this is basically our next uh, category here. 
There are also slow sleep transients that occur within a finite time, such as uh, slow sleep events, episodic tremor and sleep or low frequency event, among others. And then we have other type of uh, slow sleep transients that are more an intrinsic part of the earthquake process. And um, this would occur, include precursory sleep as observed in some lab experiments and also uh, from some field observations. And also after the earthquake occur post seismic uh, relaxation and uh, also after sleep during a certain time period. So the main scientific questions that I am aiming at perhaps start addressing on this talk are, uh, first of all, how does the seismic coupling vary within the seismic cycle of a fault? And uh, in a more general sense, how is the slow sleep release affecting the nucleation of future large earthquakes in selected regions? So I aim at investigating these topics into major transform faults that run in near dense population centers, such as the North Anatolian Fault uh, that runs in so some segment close to Istanbul, and the San Andreas Fault uh, running close to San Francisco and also uh, Los Angeles uh, Basin. These faults have the potential to rupture in magnitude up to eight earthquakes, and therefore they pose a major threat to millions of people. And at the moment, I mostly focus on the analysis of the North Anatolian Fault, and this will be the focus of the rest of my presentation. So let's start now talking about the North Anatolian Fault. For those of you that may not be super familiar with this fault, here are some general aspects. The North Anatolian Fault is a major plate boundary uh, transform fault that runs for more than 1,000 kilometers in Turkey, running from east uh, to west. And it separates the Eurasian block to the Anatolian block, uh, which is rotating in an anti-clockwise movement at approximately uh, two centimeters per year. The deformation is in fact uh, accelerating from east to west from 15 to 25 millimeters per year. And um, during the 20s, century, the majority of the North Anatolian Fault has ruptured into a number of large earthquakes with magnitudes uh, between 7 and 7.9. The first of these earthquakes was the 1912 Ganos earthquake with a magnitude of 7.2. And then there was a number of large um, earthquakes starting in 1939 in Erchinjan with a magnitude 7.8 or 7.9 and propagating towards the west in a number of ruptures, the last of them being the double ismit um sequence in 1999 with magnitudes of 7.4 and 7.1. And uh, this sequence of earthquakes left uh, the Marmara section as the only portion of the fault that did not rupture, being in direct vicinity of the city of Istanbul and its 15 million inhabitants. And finally, the estimated recurrence period for magnitude larger than seven earthquakes in this region is about uh, 200 or 250 years. The North Anatolian Fault is a very unique uh, major strike slip fault in the sense that it combines both a great historical catalog, uh, a great historical record of earthquakes that covers almost uh, 2000 years since Istanbul was a major cultural hub since 600 before Christ, as well as uh, displaying good monitoring conditions during the instrumental era. And therefore we took advantage of the great available historical records and collected the earthquakes from different uh, sources, mostly from Ambrasais and his co-workers, and also from the Grundhal and Wallstorm paper, in connection with several individual studies on paleo seismic uh, trenching. We then converted all the earthquake magnitudes from surface magnitude, which is the one that is generally provided in historical records, to moment magnitude. And as a result, we created a new historical catalog for the North Anatolian Fault, composed of 203 earthquakes and covering approximately the last 2,000 years, which, is, which we believe to be complete down to magnitude uh, 7.3, and it covers magnitudes up to 7.9. So in the next step, we estimated the raptor length from these earthquakes following empirical relations, uh, for example, from Wells and Coppersmith. 
And um, interestingly, when we plotted the estimated uh, rupture length of these events with respect to longitude, which is an approximation of uh, moving across the strike of the fault, we observed that um, in the eastern part, there has been larger earthquakes with magnitude up to 7.9, while surprisingly in the west, there is no evidence for an earthquake with magnitude larger than 7.4 over the last uh, 2000 years. And um, if we take the maximum observed the magnitude of the earthquakes from this catalog along longitude, we can see more clearly that the maximum observed magnitude tends to decrease towards the west. And interestingly, other geological characteristics of the North Anatolian Fault appear to also vary uh, from east to west. First of all, the reported ages of the fault from different types of indicators. The fault appears to be older in the east than in the west, reflecting different degrees of fault zone evolution and maturity. And uh, also we estimated the length of the different coherent uh, fault segments along the entire fault. And we found uh, that the length of the coherent uh, fault segments uh, tends to increase uh, towards the east. And this allows us to conclude that the maximum magnitude observed along the North Anatolian Fault is in good agreement with its evolutionary state, reflected in parameters such as fault age and length of fault segments, and to some extent also in the cumulative offsets, although this one is a little bit more ambiguous, such as um, because the slip rates along the fault are also very. So one of the areas of the North Anatolian Fault in which the modes of the formation are best studies, are best studied uh, is the central part of the fault near the town of Ismet Pasha. And there, Ambrasa is noticed back in the 1970 that some walls that were crossing the fault were showing an offset and, at the, same, and the same with some railroads in the local train station. And so over time, this part of the fault has been monitored uh, with different type of instrumentation, including creep meters crossing the fault, which have shown that uh, rather than continuously creeping, as I mentioned before, the fault experiences a number of shallow transient creep events, typically lasting from hours to days, and uh, before it gets uh, mostly in a locked state in between these uh, slow slip transients. The fault has also been studied, or this part of the fault has also been studied with synthetic aperture radar interferometry, which allowed to refine the long-term creep rate of this fault uh, segment. And it also allowed to identify a, a slow, long uh, transient in the same fault lasting for about 30 days and constrained at about uh, four kilometers depth, which released about two centimeters of slip during that time. So at this point, there is sufficient evidence that the shallow portion of this uh, part of the fault is creeping, but due to the lack of resolution with the different um, seismicity records, it is not clear what happens at depth other than large earthquakes also rupture this part of the fault. And so in an effort to understand the mechanisms driving the seismic slip on this region, uh, Kaduri and co-authors analyzed the fault core samples and looked at the microstructures and mineral composition. And uh, they found an interesting correlation between the location of the shallow creep and the fault couch composition. In particular, the locked uh, fault segments are deforming uh, mainly seismically and they consist on massive limestones without any clay gouge. In contrast, uh, the creeping segments accommodate uh, displacement both seismically and aseismically, and they locate in the volcanic uh, units that show clay gouges with high phyllosilicates and high mineral content uh, with clay. Therefore, at this location, the composition of the fault gouge appears to be directly affected by the frictional properties of the fault. And it was stated then that the mechanisms of a seismic slip are a combination of pressure solution creep and also frictional sliding. So let's now focus on the Marmara region for the next applications. 
In our recent studies, we mainly focused on the western portion of the North Anatolian Fault below the Sea of Marmara, which you can see here. And it contains a fault segment of about 250 kilometers that should now be very late in its seismic cycle. And uh, as mentioned before, this fault uh, runs very close to the Istanbul metropolitan region, and therefore the seismic hazard and the associated risk is very high. The main Marmara Fault is divided into a western part uh, or a western segment that appears to be partially creeping based on the observations from seafloor geodesy and also on the identification of uh, selected earthquake um, repeaters. And then a locked uh, fault segment on the eastern part, including the Princess Island uh, seismic gap, has been observed. Um, and um, the transition of these two segments uh, approximately coincided with the location of a magnitude 5.8 earthquake that occurred uh, in 2019. So in the following couple of uh, slides, we will focus on this uh, western segment to quantify the creeping deformation rates. So we are currently finalizing the generation of a refined seismicity catalog for the Marmara region, covering from 2006 to uh, 2020, the end of 2020. And uh, we are uti utilizing it to identify um, sequences of repeating earthquakes. And as you probably know, repeating earthquakes are very important because their presence can suggest that a fault segment is creeping seismically having embedded some asperities that rupture seismically. Uh, in our analysis, we maintained uh, a broad uh, frequency band with um, our waveforms. We, we filter them between 1 and 25 hertz and perform earthquake cross-correlation to identify uh, several sequences of earthquake repeaters along the entire uh, Marmara Fault. We consider two events as repeaters if they have at least uh, three cross-correlation pairs of coefficients larger than 0 0.9 and at least one inter-event uh, time larger than one year to try to exclude uh, very um, cluster, temporally clustered um, sequences. And with this criterion, we obtain 111 um, repeating earthquakes, which uh, are concentrated in 30 clusters. And uh, you can see the, these clusters uh, here with their red uh, circles. All of these clusters, except one, is uh, focused on the western portion of the fault, although the entire eastern part was also analyzed. The, density, the largest density of uh, repeaters occurs in the western Hyde region, which is this part um, here. And uh, then we observe a gradual decrease towards both uh, sides from towards the east and the west, and this represents a transition from creeping to locked. And uh, here in the lower part, you can see some example of the waveforms from one of the clusters of repeaters. And then in the next step, we relocated each of these repeater sequences independently. And we also estimated their source uh, radius and following different uh, source models. You can see here the data for one cluster and three different source models, uh, Brun, Madariaga, and Sato and Hirasawa. And we saw that in most cases, regardless of the source model that we are using, the earthquake uh, sources tend to overlap, which is an important criterion for considering event pairs as earthquake repeaters. And so in the next step, we derived uh, the creeping rates from different uh, segments of the fault in the Marmara region. For each, uh, basically, for each uh, event uh, with magnitude m in a repeater sequence, we estimated the slip um, following the empirical formula uh, proposed by Bonhoeff et al. And then for each cluster, the total cumulative uh, slip of one repeater sequence is then divided by the long term uh, tectonic slip during the observation period. We assume here an uh, annual slip of 15 millimeters. And we have also an observation period of 15 years. So this means um, what uh, is called here the proportion of uh, creep in the figure. And the idea behind this, which uh, of course can be discussed, is that the repeater sequence is a measure of the creep at this specific point uh, of the fault. 
And so this figure uh, should be treated as a preliminary result, but it already shows that the region where the largest uh, density of uh, repeating earthquakes was observed also displays the largest uh, creeping rates derived um, as explained before. Um, and then we observed a smooth transition from locked uh, to creeping, from creeping to locked, sorry, towards the east uh, and the west of these uh, regions. And interestingly, indeed, uh, we can confirm with a little bit of more of precision that the 5.8 uh, event nucleated right at the region where we observe uh, no more repeating earthquakes. And uh, in addition to this generally special um, interesting distribution of repeaters, we were able to identify some additional um, interesting aspects, such as that uh, the largest uh, sequence of repeaters that occurred on the Western High occurred very close to the epicenter of the 2012 uh, magnitude 5.2 earthquake. And this is a sequence composed of nine earthquake repeaters, which you can see here um, the locations in red and the 5.2 is the green star. Um, this sequence display relatively homogeneous uh, magnitudes, around three. And uh, interestingly, plotting the inverse of the return uh, interval, which is the time between repeater events over time um, in a log linear plot and also log, log plot, um, reverse, uh, reveals a power law behavior of the return interval of our repeaters. Um, and uh, this behavior was also observed uh, for other repeater sequences, um, such as, for example, after the Loma Prieta earthquake, and also for some additional earthquake uh, repeater sequences uh, in California in a recent study by Valhauser and Schaff. So changing a little bit of topic now, one way to quantify the proportion of uh, seismic and aseismic uh, strain release is by estimating the seismic uh, strain rates. For example, following the expression proposed by Kostrov and comparing it to the corresponding tectonic uh, strain rate. That means the geodetic slip rates divided by the width of our deformation zone. So we are currently doing that exercise for uh, the region that you see here on the screen, including the Marmara Sea and the raptor areas of the Izmit and Durche earthquakes. To do that, we divide our region into bins of um, two by two by 15 kilometers, fix the shear modulus to 30 gigapascal. And for each of the cells, we estimate uh, the cumulative moment divided by the time period of our catalog. So we are utilizing and comparing the results from two different uh, catalogs, one covering the entire instrumental period from about um, the year 1900, and we also utilize the historical catalog from the previous study that I introduced before. And uh, here you can see the special distribution of these uh, seismic strain rates for the two catalogs. And uh, interestingly, looking at the histogram showing the strain rate uh, values uh, for the different uh, cells, we see that the historical catalogs provide uh, estimations that are overall of the same order of magnitude that the tectonic uh, strain rates. But in contrast, our instrumental catalog provides overall estimations which are much um, smaller than those provided by the historical catalog. And so we interpreted these differences uh, with the fact that the historical catalog is covering several seismic cycles, and therefore it is a good representation of the entire seismic cycle, where, whereas the instrumental catalog is only covering uh, selected stages of the current uh, seismic cycle and uh, currently likely reflecting only the interseismic period. And so in the next uh, step, we define um, our seismic uh, coupling in, the, in this way here as the ratio between the seismic strain rate from the seismicity as estimated before and the tectonic strain rate estimated as the geodetic slip rates divided by the width of the deformation zone. And we calculated um, um, the, the distribution of uh, seismic coupling for time periods before and after the sequence of magnitude 7 Ismit and Durche earthquakes, without including uh, Ismit and Durche earthquakes in any of these bins. Um, so again, interestingly, we observed that uh, overall 
the seismic coupling for the 22 years um, after the Ismit and Dush earthquakes and current time appears uh, much larger than the seismic coupling before the, the Ismit and Dush earthquakes. And um, we uh, concluded that this is a, a, a good, this is, this is reflecting very well the, that indeed the seismic coupling uh, along certain portions of the fault uh, may substantially vary along the different stages of the seismic cycle. And so now, lastly, we are going to focus on our recent uh, studies on slow strain transients and the seismicity of the Armudu Peninsula directly uh, south of Istanbul. So far, we have focused on the main uh, Marmara Fault. But in fact, uh, whether the faults uh, directly south of the main Marmara Fault uh, bounding the Chinarchic Basin are also creeping is uh, still to some extent unknown. And this is also of importance. First, uh, because this is the most uh, seismically active uh, region of the Sea of Marmara around here. And it also may include the fault that hosted the 1963 earthquake, which you can see here uh, the location. And this is the largest that has occurred in the Marmara region within the instrumental era. So in the following slides, I'm going to show you our analysis regarding the observation of two slow slip transient um, events recorded in strain meter data, which uh, appear temporally connected to the occurrence of local earthquakes with moderate magnitude. I would like to start by providing some basic uh, info about the strain meters. So here you can see the available, uh, very nice uh, borehole strain meter network installed in the Eastern Sea of Marmara region, which is composed of six instruments. These are uh, Gladwin tensor strain meters deployed at 115 meters depth. And so these instruments are comparable to what it is uh, being used uh, by UNAFCO to measure the formation in the Western part of the US and also in other places such as Yellowstone. They are composed of uh, four independent gouges in the horizontal plane, which basically allow to recover the shape of the borehole. And that means that we get information on the horizontal strain tensor. Um, we typically work with uh, three independent uh, components of the strain tensor, which you can see to some extent um, represented uh, here. First, the areal strain, which represents the, the trace of the strain tensor, the 2D strain tensor, and represents uniform dilatation or contraction of the borehole, and uh, which appears to be, to some extent, more sensitive to vertical changes in the strain field. And then we have um, the shear components, uh, the differential and engineering strain components, which to some extent uh, represent compression on one side of the borehole and dilatation in the other. And they are typically more effective in capturing um, tectonic deformation. The data by uh, the strain by these strain meters is routinely processed uh, by UNAFCO, and it includes uh, the correction for borehole curing trends, uh, basic tidal modes, barometric pressure, and uh, co-seismic strain offsets. And so we go now for, to our observations. Um, for the first time in this uh, region, the Ashenkoi strain meter, whose location uh, you can see here, recorded in 2016 a slow slip uh, event, which uh, you can see here in the differential and engineering uh, components, which are the, the red and blue lines uh, here. And it is marked with this uh, yellow rectangle. So this slow slip event lasted for about 50 days and it released approximately the equivalent amount of energy of a magnitude five um, earthquake. The main part of this transient was observed uh, to start approximately at the time of a local magnitude of 4.4 event. And, um, and so therefore it's, it's temporally connected. And also when we plot um, the number of seismic events and cumulative moment release in this region, which is here plotted with the blue vertical bars and also the cumulative uh, seismic moment, which is here the blue uh, line and compare it with the same quantities, number of events and cumulative uh, seismic moment outside that region. We see that the majority of the seismic moment was released uh, during the occurrence of this uh, slow sleep event. 
And uh, we proceeded in the next step to analyze in more detail this 50-day uh, slow sleep transient. Uh, first of all, um, we corrected um, our strain meter data further, uh, applying uh, for first time to the strain meter data a variable variation independent component uh, analysis method that was originally developed by Adriano Gualandi. And it was until now applied uh, to GPS uh, data. And this allowed uh, to display the transient in, in one strain meter more, which is uh, Bosforum. And in addition, we uh, added to the analysis uh, data from three different uh, geodetic uh, stations, which you can see here displayed the uh, Bosforum uh, and Tuzlandum a little bit uh, further away from the region. So, in one of these uh, geodetic stations, we were able to also observe uh, the transient sleep. You can see the geodetic uh, recordings uh, display uh, here. And this is again, uh, this is again the station that is located uh, very close to the Bosforum area. So this suggested that the slow transients that we are observing could come from uh, somewhere between uh, this region, Bosforum and uh, Esenkoi. And uh, in the following, we decomposed um, our transient signal into two main parts. The first one from April to July 2016, which show a transient in the geodetic station and also in the change of uh, slope from the Bosforum strain meter. And the second related to the main uh, Marmara main strain transient observation of the Eschenkoi strain meter. So in the next step, we will try to find uh, the potential fault uh, sources that uh, emitted this slow sleep event. And so to that end, uh, we forward the model, the, this slow sleep transients employing uh, Okada dislocation model, elastic Okada dislocation model. And uh, we try the different uh, fault sources configurations, more than 3000 configurations to reproduce the sign of the observed uh, transients in the differential and engineering components of the strain meters. And um, for the first uh, part of the transient, which was best recorded in this uh, Bosforum uh, station, we obtained the best uh, match placing the source of the slow slip propagating along the main armutlu chinarchic fault near the instruments where we, where we recorded uh, this event. And uh, for the second part of the transient, we found uh, two scenarios that fit our observations equally well. In the first one, the slow slip continued propagating along the same fault, but eastwards. And this will be consistent or supported by the occurrence of this magnitude uh, 4.4 event, which occurred approximately at the edge of this um, fault. In the second scenario, um, the fault uh, involved uh, in this second part of the transient is a small normal fault perpendicular to the main Armutlu uh, Peninsula, as uh, 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 to the main Armutlu fault, as you can see. And um, this scenario will be favored by the fact uh, that the Coulomb stress change from the first uh, transient uh, is positive at this location. And also because uh, this fault exhibits a lot of small uh, seismicity during the time of the second um, strain transit. So we will hear much more about this little normal fault uh, in Armuto in the next uh, slides. And so to be able to track uh, in as high resolution as possible the seismicity from this region in January 2019, we went to the Armutlu Peninsula and deployed a dense uh, surface seismic network in the northern portion of the Armutlu Peninsula, connected with uh, some of the available uh, stations from the GFZ GONAF permanent uh, borehole network, which are here plotted with the CN rectangle uh, squares. Our temporary network consisted in uh, up to 30 stations, including five broadbands, 15 one hertz uh, mark seismometers and about uh, 10 geophones with natural frequency of 4.5 hertz. And uh, most of this instrumentation uh, came from the geophysical instrument pool Potsdam. So interestingly, after the identification of this uh, first slow sleep uh, transient in 2016, 
we observed in December 2018 another slow sleep transient with the main uh, strain change uh, lasting for about uh, 30 days. This slow sleep event was following a magnitude 4.6 event that occurred onshore in the Armudu Peninsula. And uh, in this, this time, this slow sleep event could be identified in at least uh, two nearby strain meters. And the good thing is that about one month after this event, we had our seismic uh, network in place to observe in high resolution the spatial temporal evolution of the seismicity from this uh, region. So for you to situate a little bit in the map, the 4.6 event uh, is uh, this red star here. I hope that you can see my mouse. Um, the yellow triangles are our temporary uh, seismic network. The GONAF portholes are these squares in Xi'an, and the strain meters that recorded this transient are here, Eschenkoi, and also Bosphorum, which is a little bit southwest of the displayed uh, region. So in that picture, the colorful dots are the seismicity that we recorded and located with our stations, color encoded with depth, and you will see that they define a fault dipping towards the northeast. And, um, Coming back to our transient, after testing different modeling scenarios, again, using uh, Okada dislocation models for the fault source, uh, we found that the most likely location of this second slow slip uh, event could be the shallower portion of the same fault that was activated in this magnitude 4.6 event. So we then uh, proceeded to detect and locate the, the micro seismicity recorded in this region for the following 13 months after the 4.6 event. The bulk of our recorded uh, seismicity is located in that region that I showed you before, is about seven by seven kilometers around the 4.6 event, which is here the gray dot. Um, I hope that you can see the video, uh, which is uh, showing the the located 1,200 events with the st uh, standard techniques, out of which we could uh, relocate about uh, 800. So as you can see, the seismicity from this video defines uh, a roughly planar structure where the main shock, the 4.6 event ruptured at the bottom, and the slow slip uh, could have activated uh, the shallower part of this fault. As you can see, the seismically active part starts at six uh, kilometers depth. So interestingly, this uh, seismicity following the 4.6 event in the same region uh, shows a very clear spatial temporal clustering. Um, it occurred in four uh, clear uh, clusters containing each more than 50 events per day, and that to some extent appear to be partially driven by the uh, seismic uh, transient forcing. We also estimated some focal mechanisms for the seismicity of this uh, region. The first uh, three sequences that I shown occurred uh, around these regions A, B, and C. The seismicity is here color encoded with the faulting style. And uh, you can see here for each of the regions, individual uh, focal mechanisms in gray and the composite uh, focal mechanism. So in general, the focal mechanisms are in very good agreement with the recovered um, uh, structures. The first ABC sequence occurred on the normal fault that we observe, and this is what we recover from the focal mechanisms. And the last uh, sequence activated a different uh, fault, deep in almost uh, subvertical uh, and uh, towards the southwest. And accordingly, the focal mechanisms from this sequence reflect as strike slip kinematics. So also the Armutlu Peninsula is a hydrothermal region and uh, as such is very rich in fluids. And to investigate whether fluids could be driving at least partially this sequence, we looked uh, at the migration patterns of the seismicity and tried to figure out uh, and fit uh, different uh, diffusion fronts with different uh, diffusivities. However, uh, when plotting the distance of the events uh, from the magnitude 4.6, so selecting as 0 0.0 the 4.6 uh, event, but also using as first event, the first event or one of the first events as each of the independent four sequences, um, we found the not super good fit of a diffusion front to our seismicity. 
We did, however, find that the early aftershock uh, events for the first uh, days uh, follow propagated away from the main shock logarithmically with distance in agreement with uh, the observation that early aftershocks could be driven by afterslip from the 4.6 uh, event. And so in the last step uh, from this very same data, we derived an enhanced uh, seismicity catalog utilizing the 800 uh, relocated events from the previous standard catalog as template uh, events, all of them which were uh, manually picked. We utilized the earthquake uh, core scan software and uh, located uh, again all new earthquake detections using the software non lean lock which allowed to decrease the magnitude of completeness to 0 0.8. And you can see here the result. We have almost 8,000 8, seismic events in about 13 months. And finally, we relocated these events uh, using the catalog peaks and waveform cross correlation, which is what, uh, what you are seeing in this uh, video. Uh, here, the seismicity is color encoded with time. And I'm sorry, to the right, the colors are not the same. To the right, the, the color is uh, reflecting basically the four different uh, sequence that I shown that occurred um, on the seismicity to this period. So we did uh, look in details at the spatial evolution of the seismicity from these four identified uh, sequences, which are here uh, displayed uh, with different uh, colors. The first sequence corresponds to the seismicity in gray which as you can see activated a large area of the fault structure in relatively small uh, seismic events. The, the event uh, size is encoded with the magnitude. Then the second sequence is here in yellow and it expanded uh, towards the both edges of the previously activated area. This is, uh, these are these two clusters. And then the third uh, sequence is totally different. This is the orange uh, seismicity and it contains the largest event in the catalog, a magnitude 3.5 event and it activated a, a much uh, smaller area. And finally, the last uh, sequence did not activate the main normal fault, but rather another uh, structure nearby. So vertical, this is a, this a strike slip um, fault that you can see, for example, more clearly in this uh, profile. And then um, we calculated some magnitude uh, frequency distributions for this uh, template uh, matching catalog. For the entire period of time, uh, the B value from the Gutenberg Richter distribution is about um, 1.4. And the one remarkable observation from this catalog is that the long term uh, temporal evolution of the B value, which is here calculated taking moving windows of about 200 events, appears to correlate with the evolution of the slow slip uh, transient from the strain meter data. The largest V value is about 1.6 and appears during the largest deviation of the background strain rate. And we see a nice decay in the V value as the strain uh, level decreases again towards the background level. So in that sense, we, we found this observation quite nice. Also variations in the V value modulated by fault creep have been uh, observed in the park field uh, area of the San Andreas Fault, where V value uh, increases where the, uh, there is a observed a shallow creep uh, recorded by a creep meter. So this observation to some extent also implies that the seismic hazard of this uh, associated fault is varying following the occurrence of the slow slip events in the region. And finally, for the four sequences, we also estimated uh, the effective uh, stress drop, which is basically the cumulative um, seismic moment of that sequence divided by the total activated fault area in that sequence. And uh, these are these uh, yellow uh, squares that uh, you see here. What we see is that the observed uh, effective stress drop is the lowest during the first uh, sequence, coinciding with the peak of the transient. And the effective uh, stress drop is the largest um, and rich natural values of seismicity during the third uh, sequence, where the strain level already came back to the almost background level. 
And so just a small final teaser of uh, what is coming next, we are starting to test uh, the application of artificial intelligence to the detection and location of seismic events in the Sea of Marmara with the purpose of obtaining uh, very good uh, seismicity catalogs uh, as the ones that uh, you have already derived in Central Italy and explore uh, what new tectonic uh, features are we able to resolve. And so as you possibly know, this type of methods are comparable in resolution to template matching. And therefore uh, it has the potential of detecting about 10 times approximately more events than conventional standard techniques. We are aiming at uh, applying these methods to all the stations available in the Marmara region, combining data from the two permanent agencies, Query and AFAD, as well as the Borjol uh, network. And we are doing this uh, in collaboration with Greg Barosa. So we basically have uh, one of the best possible collaborators on this topic that we could have. And so far, the results are very promising. We already applied it to the 5.8 uh, sequence in 2019, sorry. And we are able to detect about eight times uh, more earthquakes than the standard catalog. And we are in the order of the template matching catalog derived uh, for this sequence with about 200 events more and almost no false uh, detections visually identified. So I hope you will hear more about this application in the near future. And so this is basically all that I wanted to show you today. Um, we can go uh, quickly through my summary slides. First of all, the Istanbul Marmara region combines an excellent record of historical earthquakes um, with a fault segment that is very late in the seismic cycle. We saw that the seismic strain rate from the historical catalog is on the same order of magnitude that the regional tectonic uh, strain rate. And uh, in, in that sense, the seismic strain rate from the instrumental catalog seems to reflect um, better the coupling during individual parts of the seismic cycle. We have looked uh, in detail to anal and, and analyze repeating earthquakes in the Marmara region, and we observed a segment of about 111 kilometers long, releasing up to 40% of the accommodated tectonic uh, strain through creep. That leaves us with another 120 kilometer long segment that is fully locked. Um, and if we go to the more specific studies, um, the slow slip uh, transients that occur near the Armutlu Peninsula, we already compiled the evidence from two uh, slip transients that are mostly recorded with um, two strain meters and also with a geodetic uh, station. These uh, events appear to be temporally connected with moderate magnitude events in the region, but their duration is larger what we would expect uh, with um, after slip. And, um, this, uh, what we call this small normal fault that we call SmartNet to try to understand each other, shows vigorous seismicity below six kilometers depth and shows a very strong spatiotemporal clustering. And um, what is very important is that it is one of the very few well-documented cases of seismicity that is clearly driven by slow slip, which is recorded with the strain meter data. And this is important because there are recently a lot of studies that invoke a slow a slow sleep as a mechanism, but there is no recording. Here we have some recording. And um, the magnitude frequency distribution is modulated by the observed uh, slow sleep transient, and therefore it has, it may have a direct uh, connection with the seismic hazard of the region. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will be very happy to have your feedback and questions now or after by, by email or in the discussion. Thank you. Everyone, please um, unmute yourself long enough to let's thank Patricia for a fabulous talk.